Hello, hi everybody. Um, then I will proceed with the presentation of the speaker today. So, um, let me introduce to the speaker today, uh, Anna Makashvili. Um, it was presenting her paper hijacking solidarity, effective networking of far right publics on Twitter. Anna is a PhD candidate at the Freie Universität Berlin. Um, in media communication studies, is also working at the Collaborative Research Center Affective Society, which is at the same university. From uh, 2019 till 2023, she worked on the project Journalism and Order of Emotion, very interesting title, where she analyzed the Twitter discourse around refuge and migration in Germany, and now continues her research as part of the project Contested Order of Emotion, anti-feminist discourses on social media. Very interesting. In her dissertation, she combines qualitative, quantitative, and automated methods to examine the role of emotion and affect in the formation of far-right publics on Twitter. Her latest publication includes a hijacking solidarity for the effective formation of publics, uh, so it's a medical collection, and challenging journalistic authority in the, in the networked affective dynamics of sheminids uh, mm -hmm. in social media plus society. So please join me in welcome Anna. Anna, the floor is all yours. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. And um, yeah, I will try to share the presentation, I guess. So yeah, like you just said, I'm going to be presenting the paper, but um, yeah, I will also um, contextualize it a little bit within my dissertation. Um, yeah, I work at the, this research center, Effective Societies, and um, but I, I come from the discipline of media and communication studies. So that might be an important <laughs> um, background um, to consider um, why I'm specifically um, focusing on media and communication aspects of this. Um, yet yeah, I have a very simple conventional outline, so I'm going to introduce the case and my, my dissertation project a little bit, and I will present the theoretical framework that I'm working with. I hope it's not going to be too dense, but now that I have enough time, I think I maybe I can. Um, go through with it, and yeah, I want to I want to explain my research design and talk a little bit about the methods. This part is also a bit. I hope it's not going to get too technical for our audience, but um, yeah, if you have questions, feel free to discuss them also. And yeah, I'll present the findings of this specific case, and um, I want to kind of present my working concept for my dissertation project and talk a little bit about the theoretical implications of the of the case. Um, yeah, so this is um, kind of my dissertation, which is about um, the role of affect and emotions and far right mobilization. And I, I started this a couple of years ago. And back then it was still Twitter. And now it's X, but I'm going to be referring to it as Twitter, because all of my case studies are also from 2018 to 2020, as you can see. Um, so yeah, my first case study was about the far right riots in Chemnitz. This is in the state of Saxony, um, and it happened in um, August 2018. Um, point, yeah. I'm sorry, it's yeah. the PowerPoint. It's frozen. I don't know if you're changing it. It's. Um, do you see the cases or not? No, no. we oh, are okay. seeing the the first the first slide still. Okay, then I'm gonna do it. Try to share it again. Then we are having this issue with the PowerPoint. Um, maybe I'm going to share the whole screen again, then maybe this helps. We'll see. Um, right. Do you see it now? Yes. Yes. Do you mind and just... Maybe move? Yeah. Yes. That's yes. yes. perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is... Yeah. Yeah? Yes. So can... Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so these are the three case studies, and I, I because also the project where I started and um, focused on the migration discourse in Germany, my dissertation also kind of focuses on events that triggered a discussion or a public discourse around the topic of migration. So I am focusing on far-right mobilization, but with a more issue-specific um, discourse, which is on migration and anti-migration um, specifically. And I chose two local and one transnational case and this is the the third case which i will be also zooming in today 
um, yeah, so this is um, this was the the crisis those that happened um, in or started in February 2020, but continued for several weeks. And it was after the after Turkey's president Erdogan um, issued the statement that that despite the um, EU Turkey deal, which is a, already a controversial deal, he would be opening the borders to um, Greece for refugees to enter the European Union and. During this time, it was about 20 days, um, some, I think around 18,000 um, refugees were stuck on the Turkish Greek border and um, were met with violence from both sides. And very quickly in Germany, this movement was mobilized and um, the mobilization happened to some extent or to a very large extent actually on Twitter and on social media using this hashtag we have Platz, which translates into we have space. Or I was also told that we could also translate as we have room, but it's basically about, I, I stuck with we have space, but it's basically about we have space to welcome refugees and um, yeah, we can make space for them to um, stay here. So this was kind of the, the activist movement that started, but it was also immediately challenged by center-right and far-right parties and movements and activists. So this was, um, it became very quickly that it was a contested issue space that I wanted to um, look into as part of my dissertation. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this when I study, uh, I talk about the research design, but now I want to go through my somewhat complicated <laughs> theoretical framework. Complicated maybe in the sense that it's an interdisciplinary um, framework and I'm trying to connect affect theory um, parts of queer theory, um, especially when I'm talking about public sphere and communication and media studies. So this is, but this is already what, what we're doing in the research project, um, and that's very helpful. In the research center where I work, um, they, um, me and my colleagues, but mainly um, the colleagues that have been um, working on this topic longer have um, kind of in there, there's, there's this anthology key concepts you can look this up, look all of these concepts, um, look for all of these concepts and their definitions and um, theorizations. But yeah, I will try to briefly summarize it. That So at the research center, we um, are mainly working with a social relational and practice oriented approach, um, which means that on the one hand, affect and emotions are not considered as something that individualistic, but we are um, looking at the relationality, meaning how affect and emotions emerge are interpreted and enacted in between bodies and this can be human and non-human bodies and for media studies that means that we are looking at affect as an intensity that emerges between human bodies but also media technological and algorithmic environments and I'm not um, drawing a very strict distinction between affect and emotions, but still for, I think, for analysis and also for some conceptual clarity, it is important to draw some distinctions. And um, yeah, so I understand emotions, again, drawing on these definitions that have been um, and theorizations that have been developed at the research center. Um, emotions are specifically understood as um, culture and li linguistic categories that really name and classify affect, but also other ways of feeling. Um, but they are both char characterized by um, relationality, which means, again, that these emotions and affects not only emerge between um, different actors, but they are also often directed at political issues, be it, uh, political issues, other actors, or just world sometimes. Um, yeah, and from media and communication perspective, this is obviously very interesting, but what we had been working on in the past few years was also to understand media and journalism um, as an effective institution. My colleagues also wrote a paper about this, if you're interested. Um, and um, as an effective institution, which means that it's an institution that long, for a long time operated as a space that produces and communicates feeling rules. Um, which means that um, there are questions about um, what kind of ways of feeling and public displays of um, feelings and emotions are legitimized um, and what other ways of feelings are excluded, but also sometimes even criminalized or delegitimized. Um, and these questions are also connected to questions of inclusion and exclusion because by making certain ways of feeling legible, um, 
and visible and excluding others. Oftentimes, certain social groups or cultural groups can be excluded and others included. Um, what I'm specifically um, interested in um, as a scholar of social media platforms um, is how these feeling rules are contested in social media settings where you know, different voices um, find space and can um, claim agency also. And this is also an understanding of publics that comes from um, queer theory and feminist theory and which, um, you know, in comparison to deliberative approaches to public sphere, do consider emotions and feelings to be part of the, the public. And I'm specifically referring to Michael Varner's um, theories of publics and counter publics where he considers um, these spaces as sites of embodied and felt politics. Um, yeah, so yeah, recently or more recently, um, affective and networked publics have also been developed as concepts that really try to capture exactly these, um, these um, yeah, affective dimensions that I'm mentioning. Um, so yeah, Sisi Papagarisi introduced this um, concept of affective publics and she was specifically studying with her colleagues um, social movements that emerged on Twitter. And she she defines affective publics as natural public formations that are mobilized and connected, but also disconnected um, through expressions of um, sentiment. And she um, elaborates on this. And what I find especially interesting is the aspect of temporality. And she uses the term instantaneity, which means that affective publics often emerge instantaneously as the events are unfolding and often before they're mediatized or before they're um, communicated through legacy media institutions. So this is something that happens on Twitter also and um, yeah, creates a certain, a, a new kind of temporality um, than we knew from uh, legacy media. Yeah, so what I was also mentioning before is like one of the characteristics of affective publics is that these are contested spaces because different kind of publics emerge and, and social media platforms provide the space and the tools for act, different actors to make effective claims to agency. And network publics comes from mainly from Dana Boyd um, who try to elaborate the different or, or think through different affordances of social media platforms and how they shape um, social media users practices. So she defines um, defined um, network publics as publics that are restructured by um, network technologies, and they can be understood simultaneously as the, the very material space that is constructed through network technologies, but also the imagined collective that emerges as a result of the intersection of people, technology, and practice. And for social media, um, Dana Boyd um, develops like several categories, and one of them I wanted to mention was that a scalability, so what kind of content becomes popular is um, on social media platforms is always shaped by the infrastructures, um, technological or algorithmic um, infrastructures of the specific media. And Dana Boyd, um, I think in on one of the, in this text, um, says that um, what becomes scalable or popular on social media is often the bizarre, the crude, um, the weird, and this is something that um, I was interested in in my dissertation to also look how the affordances of Twitter specifically shapes the user's practices. So I'm trying to keep that in mind. But what I also want to stress um, um, regarding networked publics is that thinking through a networked perspective doesn't just mean to have a deterministic or does not mean at all actually to have this deterministic technological perspective on how the, the, the technological space is shaping a person's or an actor's practices, but also to think of social actors not as just autonomous beings, but, but as embedded in this technological spaces, but also in social networks. So this is one of the, one of the big parts of my analysis that I consider that I want to look at um, how um, users' practices are tied to their social ties and their, the communities that they are embedded in. Okay, I hope I'm, if, if I'm going too slow, please do let me know <laughs> and I'm gonna try to wrap it up. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the far right and their uses of emotion. I'm 
probably going to skip over this, the definition of far right because I'm sure within this lecture series you have talked about Kasmuda's definition of the far right as an, a big umbrella term that kind of you know includes different um, scales of far right, radical, and extreme right. Um, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of the definitions. If not, we can we can discuss it later. But there are a large amount of literature that. Um, you know, discusses this different ideological course of the far right. And I try to put some of the most common ones on, on the slide. But what I'm specifically interested is in is how these ideological course are communicated through emotions. Um, and this is also something that, um, yeah, uh, literature has um, already emerged on and um, Sarah Ahmed's work is um, of course worth noting um, on really looking to specific emotions such as fear, anger, resentment, but also love um, specifically for the nation as very central pillars of far-right discourse. So this was kind of the starting point also of my analysis to see how far-right ideologies relate to but also capitalize on certain emotions and how that helps as a very strong mobilizing force. But on social media, looking at the literature on social media and emotions, we often also find that it's not um, so much explicit emotions as cultural categories as I have defined before, but it's what Diana Boyd also mentioned. It's often ironic and sarcastic mo modes of articulation that are also being increasingly adapted by um, the far right. And not only, I mean, this is obviously my focus, but also it's a practice that generally is facilitated by the affordances of social media, because like I said, oftentimes here, it's the amusing content that um, finds the most resonance. So Karina Nikunen has specifically developed this concept or is working on the concept of irony as an effective practice in the far right discourse. And this I have found very helpful. And actually, Karina Nikunen also wrote a chapter um, within the anthology where my, you can find my paper too. Um, and I would recommend <laughs> reading um, their work. And um, yeah, so um, Karina Nikunen wrote about irony as an effective practice, as a very powerful effective practice, which, um, because on the first hand on social media, at least on some social media platforms, you have platform regulations and it's easier to circumvent those if they are not explicitly hateful, for instance, of certain social groups, but you're using irony as a very strong rhetorical strategy, which creates kind of a distance between um, what the, the utterance um, wants to convey, but what the materiality of it um, looks like. So it's um, it allows to um, circumvent accountability. But at the same time, what has been also discussed in literature on racist humor um, and um, irony is that it's also um, an attempt to create amusement or convey amusement um, among the like-minded. Um, so among the far-right communities in this case. Okay, I'm going to the, I'm moving to the empirical part now. <laughs> So these are the questions, the, the kind of the guiding questions of my um, dissertation. I'm not sure I'm going to be answering all of them today, but this is um, these are more of a guiding questions for my dissertation, and it, it has three parts. Um, uh, so the first one is um, how does the far right network mobilize uh, network and mobilize on Twitter through the circulation of affect and emotions, and Building on this question, I want to um, describe what kind of a public they mobilize. And this is the public sphere theory part that I want to rework um, based on the far right um, research. Um, the second one is how does the far right use affect and emotions to motiv motivate and or legitimize an anti-migration discourse since my cases also come from the, um, this very discourse. And um, finally, as I already mentioned, I want to pay attention to the platform affordances of Twitter and whether I can, um, with my methods, whether I can um, look at how they shape the media practices of the far right. Obviously there are limitations to that and there are only certain ways that I can answer these questions with my methods, but yeah, this is mainly what I, is guiding my research interests. So to this case specifically in the sample that I am 
um, that I analyzed, um, I collected tweets in real time. So as, as the event were, um, was happening, um, or actually is the, when the hashtag started um, trending, because this is a more of a defining moment on Twitter than the issue state, um, of the um, statement. So I um, collected tweets for three days and it was a total of about 33,000 tweets. Most of them were retweets and only about 13% of these were original tweets. Um, so it's, again, it's hashtag we have space. I'm sorry I didn't translate it everywhere. I'm using the German version in the presentation. But yeah, this was the, um, the hashtag. And the hashtag emerged to um, issue demands um, and directed at the German government and the, the activist organizations or just actors on social media were demanding to open borders to refugees. And it was, um, it did have a specific um, importance in Germany, I think, because um, in German media and on social media, images and videos were circulating where refugees were directly and explicitly appealing to um, German government to um, send help and pay attention. So this is kind of how the, the hashtag emerged. I am using uh, mixed methods design, as was mentioned al already in the introduction I have. So there are three parts of my analysis, which I apply to all three cases. I start with social network analysis. Um, then I conduct a computational method, which is hashtag co-occurrence analysis. And this is more of a discursive part. And then um, qualitative text analysis on selected samples. I will explain a little bit <laughs> each one of them. I, I don't know how detailed I have to, I should get, but I'm gonna try to introduce them and maybe we can discuss a bit more later. So I'm gonna start with social network analysis um, and there's this visualization, which maybe, yeah, I will explain. <laughs> so, um, but maybe I, I, I should start by explaining the method in itself um, and in my case, what it means. So social network analysis is generally a method to analyze and often also visualize the relations um, between different actors. In my case, looking at a Twitter network, it means that I am looking at um, interactions between Twitter users. So the nodes that you can see, hopefully, <laughs> are the, um, the Twitter accounts and the ties between them or edges as you call them in network theory um, signify the interactions between them. And then on Twitter, we have three different types of interactions. It's retweets, mentions, and replies. Most of them um, were retweets as I already mentioned on in my sample. Yeah, so, and the intensity of these relations um, or, or let me rephrase. The there, uh, there's also a possibility to identify communities based on the intensities of relations between actors. So um, as soon as there is a group of actors that interact with each other very frequently, um, there are different methods to use here, um, but you can, you can identify communities. And this is what I have applied. And after that, the visualization happened, or I did the visualization. And so you can see, what you can see here is that we have a lot of communities. This is what the different colors signify. Um, but also you can, this is a force directed algorithm, layout algorithm, which means that the communities that have dense connections with each other are positioned closer to each other and communities that have very sparse connections between them are more far from each other visually. So you can see that there are like these two big chunks, which are two sub networks um, that are quite detached from each other. They do have some connections between them, but there is, <clears throat> um, but you can still, um, you know, identify that there are like these two very um, large um, sub networks, which means that this network is, can be described as a polarized network. At the same time, having a polarized network doesn't mean that these are two homogeneous groups. As you can see, especially on the lower side, um, there are very many different colors, which means there are many different smaller scale communities. But because they have frequent interactions with each other and they're not very isolated from each other, this can be aggregated into a larger subnetwork. 
And generally, what you, you can also do with um, social network analysis is to apply different centrality measures, which defines how influential certain actors are. And as you can see, I have not displayed all of the usernames, but only the usernames of actors that are influential. And the centrality measure that I use is in degree centrality, which um, is defined by how often actors are interacted with. So in this case, because a lot of these tweets are um, a lot of these tweets are retweets, um, you can assume that these are actors that are mostly retweeted, but also mostly mentioned and replied to. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> and what we can see in the um, network and especially at the lower level is that the most central actors here are um, search and rescue initiatives and organizations, which is not surprising because these were also the organizations that kind of started the campaign. But there are also individual activists, um, there are politicians from the Green Party and the left. But then we have this other community um, or the larger sub-network that is that to a large extent um, um, is very homogenous because it it um, consists of one big community, the blue community. And this is where I'm going to zoom in now. Um, yeah, so this is very interesting. And even if I would not be looking for far right communities or far right actors, I would be looking at this community because it is the largest community, which means it includes like 40, some 40% 40 of all of the nodes. So all of the actors are positioned um, in this community and 41 um, or about 42% of all of the interactions. So this was already very interesting um, to me. And then what I did is I applied this centrality measure and I categorized the first as a, so the top 10 um, influential actors. Now, some of them I already knew from my previous case studies, but otherwise you just go on the, the Twitter account and, and see um, who this person is or who this actor is. And I categorized them, I had um, categories, um, but what was very interesting is that four of the most influential far-right accounts um, or accounts were far-right spam accounts that I've already known from other, um, other case studies that I did. And by spam accounts, I mean accounts that um, fulfill certain criteria, which is one of them is, for instance, anonymity or excessive posting and reposting. And um, I specifically don't use the word bots because this is not one of my research interests, I'm not really analyzing, and there are different tools for this, uh, whether it's automated or whether it's a human actor. So I cannot really tell you about this. So I'm using the, the term spam accounts. There were also four right wing to far right bloggers and journalists, um, and only one politician of the far right party, um, alternative for Germany, and one actor that I um, couldn't categorize. Um, so I used the category other. So, why do I? Is there anything else I wanted to? Yeah, so this was a very densely um, connected community. And another thing, yeah, I wanted to mention is that social network analysis is obviously um, a very fitting model to um, method to um, when applying affect theory, I think, because it is a fundamentally relational method and really looks into relationships between actors and their, the intensities of these relations and um, can also detect communities. So this is a very important step in my analysis. But at the same time, the limitations of this, of course, are that we can, it, network analysis doesn't say anything about the content that is being shared and circulated among these communities. So this is why I think mixed methods is a very fitting design for my research interests. And I do want to also go on to the discursive level. But when you have 33,000 tweets, or um, in the case of Hano, I think I had 200,000, you cannot just apply qualitative discourse analysis or whatever. It's um, going to be very hard. <laughs> We're going to need a lot of coders. So um, I have tested different methods of computational analysis. I, in this case, I have decided on hashtag co-occurrence analysis because there are hashtag samples. And I also discovered or learned throughout the process that um, on Twitter, 
the users to make use of the affordances of social media and they use hashtags to organize their discourse or to signify not only that they are talking about a certain issue, but oftentimes also how they feel about the certain issue, which is something that I'm um, very interested in. So this, um, yeah, I think I'm, I am very convinced that for Twitter discourses, this is a, um, a very um, fitting method that, um, which is also an inductive method um, and that helps you to explore the issue space when you have large amounts of data. Um, so it's somewhat similar to social network analysis because at, on the one hand, it um, displays relationships, but not between social actors, but between words. You can also do this with words. You don't have to do this with hashtags. And it can also be visualized as a network. What this means is, in my case, what I'm doing is that I'm looking at co-occurrences of hashtags, so hashtags that appear in the same tweets. And it has been also theorized that this can be understood as associative frames. Um, so instead of just looking at the frequencies of hashtags or instead of looking at single hashtags that frequently have been used, um, looking at co-occurrences kind of allows you to see in what context have been have these hashtags been used and what other discourses are also, or discursive spaces are opened up within this discourse. And yeah, um, so it already allows you some kind of interpret interpretive frames. Um, what I have noticed, so here you can only see the top 30 hashtags, otherwise it would not be very <laughs> easy Anna, to- I'm sorry to interrupt. It's just to let you know that you have 15 minutes top left. 15? 15, yes. Okay. Just in case you want to go, you know, you have- <laughs> Yeah. Stuff. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, in the, the whole hashtag network, you can see that um, hashtags that are expressing solidarity were definitely- dominating the discourse. So these were, for instance, hashtags like save lives, hashtags like um, um, open the border. So it was communicating the demands that the activist organizations are in this campaign were trying to convey. But on the other hand, we could also see find clusters um, of hashtags that were contesting these demands or contesting these claims, for instance, um, hashtag we don't have space have been often used with um, in combination with we have space. Um, and there were also um, hashtags that I have also already um, encountered in other cases. So it was not just case and issue specific hashtags, but also far right hashtags that I know from other cases, such as Merkel must go, for instance, was something that in Chemnitz discourse was already very present. So it's, it does require still a situated analysis and some contextual knowledge to interpret these hashtags. There are also some computational methods to, you know, um, look at the context where this, this um, hashtags have been um, used, but I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Um, but yeah, so what is important to me to keep in mind when, when doing um, a computation analysis is to still provide to still um, conduct steps of situated analysis and also look at how certain meanings are reappropriated and co-opted for instance yeah there is a, another study i want to reference um that looks into Iceland with greece which at first seems like a supportive or maybe like innocent i think they use um hashtag but then um, analyzing the discursive space shows that it's um, a far-right space, which um, also goes beyond the case of Turkey and Greece crisis, but tries to mobilize far-right sentiments. Yeah, maybe I'm going to try to <laughs> go a little bit quicker, but yeah, so on the, on, um, I did uh, mention that I identified 10 influential actors through network analysis, and then I create a separate sample with their tweets to conduct qualitative analysis. And this is also reading for affect is a method that my colleagues here also developed. And it looks um, on three at three dimensions, um, attribution of emotions and emotion words in text. Um, and then based on these attributions, also whether collective groups and collective bodies are constructed through text. And finally, it looks at the materiality of discourse, which mainly refers to rhetorical strategies that add intensity to um, the emotions that are expressed in the text. So yeah, I brought some examples. I'm not as sure as how to visualize the qualitative <laughs> research as I am with um, quantitative and automated methods, but yeah, maybe you can, you have some ideas. 
So I brought some examples from the tweets. What was interesting to me in this case compared to other cases is that I could not really find um, many explicit expressions of emotions. So this was really one of the, the findings of this study that irony sar and sarcastic commentary was um, a very central and dominant effective practice that has been used in this specific discourse. And what is interesting in these examples for me is that firstly, irony as an effective practice, what does it do? Um, and what happens in these cases is that it is used to create antagonist groups. Um, and it is, um, yeah, it is also used to um, reclaim the we in we have space. So this is um, what I had been looking at. Um, the antagonist groups that emerge here is one um, that um, started the campaign and they are imagined as this very elitist and leftist group. And there is an, there is an ideational, but at the same time also material and affective distance that is created between the reclaimed we, the people, which is a very populist uh, constellation already, right? And between these um, elitist groups and there are material possessions that are um, kind of ascribed to them. Um, there's also this, um, this collective imagined group is um, embodied in um, this word do-gooders. This is how I translated it, but the German word was Gutmensch. And I think that's kind of a literal translation. And it was also often used as um, a hashtag. And it was a, a sarcastic demarcation of the people who were trying to mobilize solidarity for the refugees. And they were ridiculed and through this ridiculing there was yeah, exactly that kind of a distance created between we, the people who are actually struggling and having social issues that you can see listed on these tweets. But what's interesting is that in, when, when these issues and threats were thematized, um, in these cases, the we is decide, decidedly imagined as a white nationalist or nativist. We and the, the demands and the imminent threats that the refugees were um, facing at the moment were not considered and were not included in this collective needs. I'm going to try to move on. Maybe we can, if you have questions, we can talk about this later. Um, what was um, also interesting in qualitative analysis is at first I was interested in whether different types of actors communicated emotions and affects differently, but this was not something that I found. Actually, what happened mostly was that often influential actors post rhetorical questions or used extreme juxtapositions. So in their modes of communication, there was not much difference. But what I realized is that because I also um, analyzed the replies, but only if they were using the hashtag, because that's how I sampled, um, I realized that tweets and replies had different kind of, uh, were using different kind of communications. And I realized that replies were actually um, operating as, um, intensification. So um, if um, the tweet, the original tweet was um, implicitly racist or were using, was using irony to express um, racist sentiments, then sometimes, as you can see in the third example, for instance, the replies were adding more intensity and were more explicitly racist. And also they were using more multimodal communications. So for instance, um, a series of emojis, GIFs, videos, embedding videos, and so on. Okay, I'm gonna recap. <laughs> so what we saw um, on the network level um, and what was interesting to me is one of the characteristics that also Papa Carisi and her colleagues talked about is that effective publics are characterized by having crowdsourced elites. Crowdsourced, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it means that um, they're often mobilized by actors that are maybe not influential offline, but really emerge as specifically social media actors, such as the spam accounts. Um, and another interesting, while connecting the findings from network analysis and discourse analysis was that while um, in the network analysis shows that the far right managed to mobilize the largest sub-network within this public, they were on discursive level still reclaiming the and, um, and redefining it as a position that is threatened and marginalized. So it was very interesting the, to see the performance of a marginalized position while also mobilizing the lo loudest and largest network. And what I want to do with my um, with all of this analysis and how I want to connect it to my yeah theoretical work is to kind of 
I'm working on a concept of how to describe far-right publics. Um, and there are obviously already some um, literature um, dealing with this issue and with this question, and I'm drawing on that. And I do want to um, propose to um, propose this concept that understands far-right publics as one that on the one hand emerges and relies on the circulation and amplification of shared affects, and on the other hand, is also very strongly defined by their performance of counterpublicness. So it's very central in their discourse to perform attention with an imagined general public, with the dominant societal structures and meanings, and to situate themselves, so the far-right public, in a state of marginalization and victimhood. I really want to recommend this paper that came out this year, Jackson and Christ, if you're interested in this topics. They developed the concept of defensive publics to um, describe a far right public formations. And I think that also might be very fruitful and interesting also. Um, and I recently also saw that Lili Chuliaraki also um, is issuing a book about victimhood. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, yeah, and I also, yeah, finally, I want to um, shed light to the, the effective dimensions of um, far right publics with my study and how this performance of counterpublicness is effectively charged in many ways, many different ways, but essentially to mobilize a public site where a nativist and racialized belonging is created and enacted. Yeah. Okay. So this is the book where the paper um, <laughs> was published and there are some references. I don't know if you're interested in some of the papers to let me know and I can also send it to you. Thank you very much for listening.